Well, uh, thank you very much, Matt. Thank you, missions team, you all that are going. What, what, a, what a great thing to be able to go. And, and what Matt said is exactly right. It's, it's an all of us thing when, it, when a subset of us goes. So the, the praying, the providing for, for some to go, and then the going. And I encourage you to consider going at some point. We have other trips coming up this year, and in the years ahead, we're getting back into um, not only a schedule that's similar to pre-COVID, but even advanced from that. Uh, with we, we do, we have great partners around the world, great opportunities to go and actually make a difference. And when you step out in faith to do something like that, uh, your faith has radically changed. I've got a good friend who, uh, at least f- far as I know, started the phrase. <laughs> he said, a change of pace plus a change of place equals a change of perspective. And that's absolutely true. It's, maybe that's a good formula for why we need retreats, like our men's retreat coming up in a little while, that kind of a thing. But it really has kind of a, a amplified uh, weight to it when you think about doing that in a, on a mission trip to go serve and spread the gospel like that. So, in fact, I wanna, there's a whole other group that's going with our group. I, I, wanna, I just want to kind of sh- anecdotally share this story that's inspiration, I hope, for you. So over the years, I, as part of my hope and and feeling of how God's wired me and called me in my life. I, I have done different things kind of outside the church walls to try to reach people and minister to people, disciple people, and, you know, of course, ideally bring people into the church as well. But part of that through the years has been several years ago, and Aaron helped me significantly in this. We had a Bible study for uh, a lot of the boys on the football team over at Hillgrove High School for years. And then uh, at different points, we took some of those boys on a mission trip down to the Dominican Republic, the same place that this team is going. And just the high impact that God, you know, the, the difference that God made through the boys going and then, of course, in the boys' lives, so much so that um, this past summer, a young man, incredible young man, I think he's maybe 21 years old, 22 maybe, didn't go to college right out of high school, but he had played football at Hillgrove and um, went right, I think he owns his own concrete company now. In fact, he says... You know, part of what God used to send him in that direction was all the concrete work we did when we were down there uh, in the Dominican. But um, he called me, like maybe back in June, Jake Bond is his name, and he said, Pastor Tom, uh, I just, we got to go on a mission trip again, and we got to take some boys, some high school boys, some high school football boys. I was like, all right, Jake, I I don't know, what can I do to help? (laughs) And of course, what he was saying is, we got to do this, and you got to lead this. I was like, oh, great, all right. So, (laughs) but to me, it's so... It's so worth it. I mean, here's Jake Bond, this, this precious young man that I know, incredible young man. He was so changed. His life ch- changed by going this one time back when he was in high school. He's like, we got to do it. We got to do it with others. And so in addition to our 15 we have going from Mars Hill, we've got 10 of us, including me, nine plus me, tagging along as well, kind of in essence, uh, to go do some uh, which I'm super thrilled about, uh, con- heavy construction uh, while we're there. Sa- same week, same trip, but um, it, it's basically, it's Coach Ironside, many of you know, who, who's been coaching over at Osborne High School, and I haven't had the kind of the hands-on week-to-week Bible study relationship with any of the football boys like I did several years ago, but Coach Ironside, they put it out there, we, start, we targeted the same week, so we're piggybacking on the flights and the hotel and the, all these things, or the place, I don't think it's a hotel, but wherever it is we're staying, and um, and we've got four boys, four juniors off the Osborne football team that are going. Uh, three coaches, Jake and his dad and me. And, and another coach, Coach Ron Veal, has gone with us before too. So anyway, uh, pray for us. Pray for that group too. And, and kind of going in sync or in conjunction with, but in some ways we'll be on kind of separate work schedules while we're there. And it's kind of a little bit of a different group. But it's the difference that one of these trips makes. It's huge. So I can, even if it's one of those things that as you hear about it and you see us pray over people, you, it, your initial reaction is, oh, that could never be me or I don't see myself as that. I want to just push back a little bit and say, uh, don't just let that be the end of your story as it relates to that. All right, just, just consider that. And I want to um, also just uh, do a, a couple other little shout outs and recognitions and, and thanks and, and whatnot. But we had a great night last night with our um, with our uh, Galantine soiree, and thankful for that. So thanks for everybody that put in hard work on that. But Mike, I heard you made the dinner for everybody. Is that right? In fact, somebody this morning says, I heard Micah Owens made dinner for everybody. So Micah, would you just stand up? Let me a shout out there. Oh. <laughs> all right, that was a more robust appreciation than I was anticipating. But all right, very good. Thank you for that. 
And I tell you, people just doing so many things. I was down in the, in the basement during the beginning of the worship time. I don't know, we got 20 or 30 of us down there. Thank you for everybody who takes time to go down there. As you could tell, seating is at a premium. And I think Aaron in his announcements uh, mentioned this. If you ever come, a way to think about it where we can come and serve others. It looks like we're pretty well uh, filled here. But if you're in the middle, move to the middle. If you get here earlier than others, or if you're in the outside, move to the outside. Uh, middle, middle, outside, outside, and it helps just kind of free up space as people continue to come in. If basement works for you, awesome, but we've got to keep extending the loving, open, welcoming arms of Jesus here uh, as people come to meet with him, and so I'm so thankful. And I got to say, too, I, drew, I pulled in, and a bunch of us, you know, parking is kind of a thing, too, at times, and a bunch of us were thankful that the oil change place next to us enables us to use their whole place to park, and when I pull in at about a little bit before 8, I mean, to see all of our band and worship team members over there, especially on a morning like today, you know, where it's raining, you got to kind of come through and risk a little bit of mud on your feet kind of a thing, all that, just full over there at the oil change place. I just want to shout out of gratitude to you guys who, who, who went the extra mile to serve the rest of us in that, in that way this morning. Thank you for doing that. And, uh, and finally, I've got a good buddy here, Brad Parkhurst. Brad, would you stand up? I want everybody to see you. This guy is one of my dearest friends, and uh, he's the pastor of Vertical Life Church out in uh, Paulding County, East Paulding, and he's, he and I are in the same kind of pastor group. We meet monthly and pray for each other, and he's on a sabbatical, has a sabbatical now for a few weeks, and so it took a Sunday on his sabbatical time to come worship with us, and I tell you what he does, what he and his wife do, and anybody that serves in that kind of a role is, uh, is just amazing, and the way he does it amazes me, and he's He's a source of strength in my life as I have the privilege then to come back and serve here. So, Brad, I love having you here. Thanks, brother. Yep. All right, so here we go. We're going to do something different today. We've been, um, the, the way we do things at Mars Hill is we open the Bible. Usually the first thing I say is open your Bibles too. And, un, you know, it, we're not doing that this morning. We're going to take a different approach. We are going to be saturated with the scriptures today. It would be a, 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 an egregious uh, crime not to be saturated with the scriptures. If I give you something that's from my heart, not from God's heart, I've, I've shortchanged you and, and treated you very, very poorly. And I don't want to do that. Uh, but we're not necessarily, we're, we're going to jump out of our study of the Psalms. So we've been going through Psalms, we're, three weeks we're going to jump out of it, then we're going to jump back into it. But there's a, there's a reason we're doing that. And so what we're going to do is, is focus on the heartbeat, the, the essence of our existence. We've got even a, a graphic for the next three weeks. It's falling under the banner, the heading of love your neighbor. And maybe you remember this. If you don't, this will be highly uh, significant instruction for you. If you take the whole Bible and boil it down to one or two things that, that are the essence of, of all 66 books of the Bible, all of the commandments in the Old Testament, all of the principles and precepts uh, you know, contained throughout, it boils down to love God with everything you are and everything you have, and then love people, i.e. your neighbor, in the same way you love yourself. In fact, Jesus himself answered that. We have it recorded in Matthew. It's in one of the other Gospels as well. A guy was like, Jesus, what's the most important commandment? Like, kind of sum it up for us. Can you boil it down? And he, he did very clearly. Everything points to this. And if you get this right, you're doing it right. You're, you're, you're understanding the design of your life. When he says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, this is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, love your neighbor. And of course, in one of the other contexts, this is where we get the Good Samaritan story. Somebody said, well, then who is my neighbor, right? You know, let's, let's get technical here. Instead of, let's just jump over the whole spirit of the law and let's, like we tend to do, right? We like to parse it down. Does that mean, like if we hear a, a teaching on tithing and we go, is that gross or, that, or is that net? Or, or something like that. We, we want to kind of get down into the technicalities every time. And when somebody did that, well, then who's my neighbor? You know, Jesus told this awesome story that in essence says, whoever you encounter, whoever you cross paths with, Whatever person you see, whatever person you see in need, be a neighbor is, is kind of the essence of what he, how he ended up answering that. And then he says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. You want to get the whole 39 books of the Old Testament? You want to get the whole spirit of the New Testament? This is it. And this is, in, in fact, why, how we articulate who we are and why we even exist. Why do we do this? You know, why do we get up on Sundays and come here even on rainy days? Why is there this thing that we happen at this point in time in human history that, that, to call Mars Hill Community Church? We exist for this purpose, for this reason. Basically to love God and to love people. We phrase it this way. We're, we exist to invest our lives in sharing Jesus Christ and growing his followers so that people can 
love God with all their heart, all their mind, all their soul, all their strength, so that they can know him. And as, as Matt did a great job summing up, as that last song really set the tone for, so that people can, can sanctify Jesus as Lord and holy. Basically, sanctified means to set him apart. It's like to designate him the way that last song said, who else? There is no one else. And our hurting, aching, dying world needs the one, the one who is alone, the solution and the Savior. It's Jesus. And so we love them by investing our lives. There's nothing we could give ourselves to that's more significant. There's nothing we could leverage all of our financial resources for. There's nothing we could leverage all of our experience and wisdom or um, our talents and gifts. There's nothing we could pour all of that into that's more significant than introducing them to their Savior, Jesus. That's it. So we exist to invest our lives in sharing Jesus. And then once they come to faith in Jesus, helping them grow, discipling them, teaching them, as Jesus tells us, teach them everything I've commanded you. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So we do that. This is where life is found. This is where hope is found. This is it. We got a short little, you know, spin on this planet, all of us. And we don't want to waste a moment of it. We want to invest it this way. And so this is the deal. This is why we're here. This is what we do. And so we're going to take three weeks to get really clear. There's some reasons behind why now. I'm going to hit here in just a second. But uh, we're going to take three weeks to do that. We know what our mission is, but we're going to emphasize it in such a way. We're going to focus on it with a certain level of, of intensity in these next couple of months that, that we're going to set up today and the next two Sundays. Uh, not just to say we've got a, a, a season here at Mars Hill where it, it, we're going to treat it like a project. No, no, no. We're going to give attention to our mission in a way that we're going to treat the next couple of months uh, as a mission within itself that will serve the broader ongoing mission that defines our very existence. So that, that's what we're doing, okay? And here's how I envision it. So it's not our typical, let's, you know, kind of Bible teaching kind of service today. Here's how I envision today's gathering in the next two weeks. In my mind, I'm kind of envisioning like, um, you know, like pilots in, in a wartime coming into their, their mission briefing room to get their instructions. That's kind of what I'm envisioning. So I, I grabbed this picture of some of our, our fighter pilots in World War II. This was some of the guys out of the Tuskegee Airmen. And just look at the intensity of their focus. They're, they're being given specific objectives. They're being given specific uh, mission uh, uh, steps in what they've been called to accomplish. And that, that's the spirit with which I would like to ask you to participate today and the next couple of Sundays. It's this significant, so we're going to be saturated with Scripture, but I even love some of these guys in the front row, man. They got their notebooks out, and I, if you've got something to write with, and you're going to get some tools that I want you to own and, and use in response to these next few Sundays, and you're going to have some specific action items, just like a, a combat mission of pilots during wartime. Here's the specific actions, the specific objectives, the specific tools you'll need to be successful. So our, our gatherings today and the next two Sundays, I want to kind of be like this more than uh, even what we're typically, what we typically uh, do on a Sunday morning here. And here's part of the motivation, heartbeat, a lot of the heartbeat of the motivation, is we, we know, I think, and I don't even think we need, would even need to give any examples. I think we all just know our world is hurting we live in days that are dark and darkening. And we as Americans even have a unique view of what has been unfolding and the trajectory of our culture specifically, of our country specifically. You know, I, I love some of these books, the, the Good to Great, The Built to Last, and then the other one that Jim Collins wrote was How the Mighty Fall. And you can trace it in organizations, you can trace it, trace it in, in athletic teams, you can trace it in corporations. You know, there's the rise and the buildup and the apex, and then there's the decline. And you can trace it historically in nations as well. And I don't, I don't know what the vote would be, how overwhelmingly it would be, but if we had to vote, do you think we're in decline? I think we feel it deeply. Yeah, I think I maybe 100%, I don't know, yeah. It, we, we just know it. Don't even have to go too much into statistical data. And that's not okay with me. 
And that's not okay with our pastoral staff and our elder team. That's not okay with the mission with which God has given us. It's not okay with the commission and command of Jesus that we're, we're salt and light in our world. We are to pray for the welfare of the city in which we live. We are to be agents of influence, agents of life, agents of resurrection in a day, dying and decaying culture. And so, I, I don't know, I, so you, we probably don't need any of this, but let me just, I, I was thinking about this just from my own perspective as I analyze where we are as a nation. Let me, let me ask you this question to, to help maybe frame up uh, our, our focus today in these next couple of months. If I were to ask you that over the last 50 years, and you could maybe use 30 years or 70 years, whatever you want, I'd say, for us as Americans, describing the condition of us collectively, just use this one facet, this one factor. Would you say that we as Americans trust these different groups or entities more than we did 50 years ago or less? I think it's overwhelmingly less. And I don't know how to put exact data points on it, but do we trust our government or our governmental leaders more now than, than Americans did 50 or 70 years ago or less? Oh, radically less, right? Radically less. Or, or, or our, even our, our uh, political uh, rivals. Like I remember one, of my, my, one set of my grandparents, my grandparents on my mom's side, one was Republican, one was Democrat. And they lived together in matrimonial harmony as far as I know. <laughs> And they would joke with each other a little bit, right? And they would uh, they'd do things like try to sneak out and go vote on, on election day without the other one knowing to see, you know, because anyway, it's just to know, ah, we got one more vote for our side. It's almost hard to imagine that's even possible these days, isn't it? What, what made up the political rivals back then, at least they, they would have trusted each other a little bit, like at least they're honest people even though we disagree on policy matters or something like that, right? Not the case anymore, is it? It's becoming more like these horrific uh, other countries. And by the way, all this work and missions that I've been privileged to be participate in over all the years, it, it awakens you to the condition and the, the trajectory of our own nation when you see the condition in other places. What does it mean for some one particular party to get in political power, to, to have the power? What it means is they automatically start trying to attack and imprison or otherwise demolish their rivals. It kind of feels like we're increasingly headed that direction, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it's awful. What about the educational system? The distrust in it certainly rising. Even the health care system. Some of the best people on the planet go into health care, right? And yet even in recent days, we've, we've got a pretty broad distrust of the, the authorities represented there don't we? And you just go down the list. Law enforcement. I mean, I've been in countries where, and you, some of you have been too, you get pulled over by the police, you're gonna about to get shaken down and you're, gonna, you're about to extorted for money if you, don't, if you want to not get thrown in jail. If you can't trust the people there that the way our, a lot of our police agencies say, you know, we're here to, to serve and defend, to you know, guard and watch over. If you can't trust the, yeah, so it's increasing. Even, even like FBI or, you know, whatever the case is, are, are they investigating as they should and who they should and for the motives that they should? All those, we're starting, the distrust is rising. We can't keep going this way and still be okay, right? The judicial system, we're we sure it's, it's committed to blind justice across the board? No, we're not sure of that, or increasingly, we're less sure of that. Even just our neighbors, <laughs> And when the distrust continues to rise, the, the, the society disintegrates. The things that are what we might say that the pillars of the structure of the society, when we distrust the very, uh, the very framework of the society and the systems, that we're headed to a bad place increasingly in, in a hurry, I'm afraid. I just throw this out as, as an example, and you know, we could come up with a hundred examples. I read this just recently. Accidental overdoses is now, one, is now the number one cause of death of people under 40 in 37 states. What's going on? And we know the mental health crisis, quote unquote, we know anxiety, stress, and in many of those states, suicide is a close number two. What is going on? The structures are falling apart, the souls within the society are aching, hurting, and in despair, turning to drugs and every other thing, and even to their own detriment and harm. 
So I know we kind of have a sense of that, right? Here's, here's the, the impetus for today and the next few weeks. I believe now is the time and we are the people to do something about it. It's not okay. We're here. We are the church to make a difference. If anybody can combat this, if anybody has the opportunity to change the trajectory, to change the very soul of the society, it is us. We and we alone have the ultimate answer. We have the power, God within us, and God through us. And we have, I believe, the calling. And so that's the point here these next three weeks is to to get specific on that calling with action statements, to pursue the mission. So this is the direction I'm going. This is the direction our staff is going. This is the direction our elders are going. And I just want to ask you to consider all of us going there together. And so we're calling this the next three weeks. It's Pray, Care, Share. And we've got some programs pieces to it, but it's not ultimately at its heart intended to be a program. In fact, I know it sounds more like it rhymes if we said prayer, care, share, but we want it to be action words, so it's pray, care, share, (laughs) and today is pray. We're going to talk about praying, and prayer is where it starts, and why. Why is this whole emphasis something we're picking up right now and moving on. And really, it's what Matt did a great job explaining here, and the worship team did a great job drawing our attention to. It's ultimately about the glory of God, because God has created all things. This is His universe. This is His world, and the souls out there that are living so lost, so wounded, so far from Him, so disconsonant with His purposes for them. He, His glory needs to be respected and amplified and celebrated by bringing those lives living so far from him into relationship with him. This glorifies him. This is why Jesus came and shed his blood. It's why God created in the first place. So why do we want to reach people and bring people in who don't know him yet and who are out there suffering apart from his transforming love. Why, ultimately for the glory of God, God is honored as God deserves to be honored. As Ethan was telling us about that last song, he he deserves to be worshipped and people purely worshipping God are the people who will be walking in the fullness of his design for their lives to begin with. As Jesus said, I came to give you life and to give it to you to the full. He's glorified when souls that are lost today are found tomorrow. So that's why. Number two, really, the overflow, these things are interconnected with each other, but number two, it's it's the eternal well-being of every soul. We know that the, the basics of the whole message of our Savior, for God so loved the world that He gave His Son. God loves Jesus, and I came to seek and to save. I'm on a seek and save mission and we are too. He's commissioned us to that. And I know we know that, and I know we generally live that at Mars Hill, but, but it's time. Our, our society, the people around us, the, the, the need is great. The time is ripe. That if, we, if it's not now, I don't know what we would be waiting for. I don't know what tomorrow would hold. But every single person that we'll cross paths with, that we'll drive by on the highway with, or that we'll rub shoulders with in the grocery store, or that you meet in your schools or or at work, or pass by in the cul-de-sac or on the street, every single soul spends eternity somewhere. And the love of Jesus for those destined for hell, it's time that it takes not only a deep root within us, but that it lights a fervent fire through us. It's time. The glory of God is why the eternal well-being of every soul. And then that third kind of effect of souls coming to Christ. Why? We do want the cultural effect of saved souls and transformed souls. Yeah, we, we long to hand off to kids. We long to hand off to grandkids a place where crime isn't as constant and imminent of a threat. And on and on and on. 
And there are ways that as we lead neighbors to Christ, as we lead people to Christ, as we are the salt and light in the world, as, as people in numbers, and I'm talking, I don't know, what does Cobb County look like? What does East Paulding, what does Paulding County look like? What does Atlanta look like? What does Georgia look like? If one little group kind of lit the fire and started going in the direction that I want us to go. It can look like, history's shown us examples of how it does look like, even society transformation, even a, a declining nation being revived. All of those ways in which we, the, the, the essence, the, the, the critical nature of trust, that trust plays within uh, any society, any nation, all of the, what's, what's needed for trust to be regained? Well, trustworthiness. How do those that lead us in the justice department or the health department or the educational system, how, do, how does all of their influence begin to change? Well, as they become people who are trustworthy people, who as their hearts have been changed by Christ, now the influence they bring to bear in the structural, systemic parts of our building blocks of our society, as they start to change and they start to grow, it, it, cha it can change everything. It can redirect. It can revive and brothers and sisters, every single individual soul is our focus. But the hope for our nation is that every single individual soul is beginning to, to put the, the sum total together of how many individual souls it becomes in our area, perhaps hundreds, perhaps thousands. And you never know beyond that as it becomes a movement. Historically, it's what we've observed over time. It's what's called revival or awakening. I know you can nuance the difference between revival and awakening, but, but this movement of the Spirit of God to transform and save souls on such a level that the society is impacted, ba basic definition. And it starts with the church and churches and goes out from there. And oh boy, don't get us started, right? Don't get me started on the, the state of the church in our country. The second great awakening in the United States saw the rise of certain denominations like the Baptists and the Methodists. They kind of, uh, kind of went further beyond what had originally in the founding of our nation been, uh, you know, the, um, the Anglicans and the, um, the Brethrens and the, oh, I'm drawing a blank on all the, the Congregationalists and some of the others. It became Baptist and Methodist, and we kind of have a feel of what's happened with the United Methodist denomination recently, right? falling absolutely apart, lost its way, lost the gospel, needs a revival. The church needs the revival. The land needs the awakening. And when these things happen, when this awakening comes, it changes. I don't, we probably, most of us don't know, but if you've been a, a historian at all, you, can, you know, the first great awakening, this awakening and revival that was pre-revolutionary war, it really set the whole chart and course for the revolutionary war. The foundational structures of our nation, things we take for granted, you know, built on individual liberty, individual dignity, equality of every human being made in the image of God. Those were the results of this great movement of the Spirit of God in that first great awakening. Our emphasis on education as a nation. We're, we're an education-focused nation. That goes back to the first great awakening in and around the idea that people need to be able to read to be able to study the Bible. That's where it started. As people were coming to Christ, churches even in the most rural places in the new about-to-be nation were, were teaching people how to read. At that point, making New England in the mid-1700s one of the most literate places on earth. It's what spurred the, the, the start of Princeton and Brown and Rutgers and Dartmouth. Human equality, individual human dignity. These things, that the nature of our nation that is very humanitarian, that's very philanthropic, it goes back to the First Great Awakening. The First Great Awakening mobilized people to fight the evils of slavery from the very foundation of our nation. And the Second Great Awakening in the 1800s, mobilized people to finish it off through the abolition movement. I love this. I came across uh, the first uh, African-American lady to ever be published, poet to ever be published in the United States, a lady named Phyllis Wheatley. Talking about the effect of the first great awakening on her, she had been a formerly enslaved American, was freed, and she wrote a poem on the event of 
George Whitfield's death honoring George Whitfield. He was one of those preachers in that first great awakening. Had a massive effect across what was then the colonies. In 1770, she wrote this about the effect of George Whitfield on her and on those that George Whitfield and other Christians were reaching with the gospel. Here's, here's a couple of lines of her poem about George Whitfield. It says, take him, talking about Jesus, take him, my dear Americans, he said, be your complaints in his kind bosom laid. Take him, ye Africans, he longs for you. Impartial savior is his title due. If you choose to walk in grace's road, you shall be sons and kings and priests of God. Just powerful. I, you know, I, I believe the hope for the United States of America 2024 and this next decade, the only hope is a revival and awakening. You know, we, we, and, and it was many of these wise, godly, and Christian influenced people who put a lot of the structures that make up what has been through our lifetimes a very stable and trustworthy governmental system. They put a lot of those systems in place, filled with famously, you studied, studied this maybe if you paid attention in school, you studied some of this in your civics or political classes or history classes, those checks and balances, system of checks and balances, right? But here's the deal, and here's the reality. Systems can only go so far in producing what they're set up for. At the end of the day, systems with all their wonderful and wise checks and balances cannot ultimately produce trustworthiness. That is dependent on the spirits of those running the systems. Because what do we do? And you know it's how we do it. And it's, it's an effect of a revival that might actually be something tangible. What do people do? What do human beings do in our lostness, in our corrupt fleshly state? You know what we do when we find a system? We try to work it, don't we? We want to work that system. Figure out how to, where is the loophole? Where's the twist? Where's the way to make it work for me? And we're so good at it, and it's such a never-ending process that no system can withstand a broken human spirit, ultimately. Much less a broken spirit that defines the majority of the society's members. At some point, for the system to, 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 to work in a trustworthy way, it requires the spirits of those administering the system to be right. John Adams, from the very beginning, said as much. He said, our Constitution was made for a moral and religious people. It's wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Brothers and sisters, I think it's, the time is now, and I think the people are us. And I'm not just saying that. I mean this with all my heart. With every weight of my, however many days God's given me left on this earth, and I want to call us to that. I feel that, here, here we'll go into Psalms. We'll do a little Psalm study this morning. In Psalm 85, the prayer is, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? And this is where we're going to start. We're going to start in prayer. We're going to cry out to God. And we're going to ask him to bring a revival. We're going to ask him to bring an awakening. And we, we're going to rely on the scriptures as he said at different points. And I know it had maybe more uh, specific application to the place and time he said it, but I believe it has application even beyond, even to us. When God said in 2 Chronicles, listen to this, and let this be our, you know, our marching orders, the drumbeat of our focus. God says, if my people who are called by my name, and I, I boy, I, I don't have God, I don't have the Lord Jesus standing right here and saying, please, Mars Hill, I'm talking to you. And I'm talking about you. If you, you are my people, and if you will call on my name, you'll humble yourselves and pray and seek my face and, and deal with whatever internally in you needs to be brought into obedience and alignment with God. Humble yourselves and pray and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways. Here's what's going to happen. I am going to hear you from heaven, and I will forgive the sins of your land and heal I think there's hope for America, and it starts with us on our knees like this. It's not, a, it's not a unique verse in Scripture. It's not the only place we see this heartbeat of God for the revival and the awakening of our nation. In, in the, old, in the uh, minor prophet Joel, God says, even now, even now when you're down on the downslope of your decline, even now when it seems like maybe it's too far gone, yes, even now, if you will return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping, and I want to just put a note there on the fasting. 
with fasting and weeping and mourning, if you will rend your hearts and not your garments, it's not just this external show of, oh, we're, we're moaning and complaining. We're, we're like, oh, we recognize. It's not this, just this, it's this true depth of heart, heartfelt repentance and returning to the Lord. If you'll do that, he says, he's gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding love, and he relents from sending calamity. I believe there's a chance for revival and awakening in our land in our day. And I love this other place, this other verse I want to bring in from Ezekiel 22. It's like God saying, I, I'm just looking for somebody who actually will kind of say, I'll own that. I'll get on my knees. I'll fast and pray. I'll rend my heart, not my garment. I'll seek your face, God. I'll stand in the gap, as he says it in Ezekiel 22. And in, that, in those days, it sounds a little bit like our day, right? I got to hang out a little bit yesterday with one of my college friends who we lived together when I was in Memphis in uh, seminary and they've moved out of Memphis and he was just saying all his friends he's lifelong he was just saying the 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 exposure to dangerous crime that he's hears more and more and more of specifically in Memphis I'm like well I think we're getting some of that around Atlanta and Powder Springs and other places too it's just notably and frighteningly seemingly getting on the brink of maybe even out of control and that's what's going on here. The people of the land practice extortion. They commit robbery. They oppress the poor and needy. They mistreat the foreigner, denying them justice. And here's what God says. I looked for someone among them. Is anybody there who would build up the wall, meaning build up you know, the defenses, build up what's right, rebuild the trust, in essence, the trustworthiness, and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so that I would not have to destroy it. <clears throat> but in that day, he said, I, I didn't find anybody. This is where we come in. And this is the mission I want to set before you. If you're willing for us to say, I'll be that guy. I'll be that girl. We'll be those people. If God's looking for somebody to stand in the gap for this nation, to somebody to fast and pray and seek the Lord, I want to ask you to consider saying it, it'll be me. I believe that now is the time and we are the people. And so that's what the next three weeks are going to be about. <clears throat> We're going to dedicate ourselves to a month, long, a month of dedicated prayer and fasting. The month of March is going to be our month of fasting and prayer at Mars Hill Community Church. And then we're going to build on, this is what care will be next week. We're going to, we're going to intentionally together make efforts to serve our neighbors and extend God's love to them and, and third this prayer care and then the share and we're going to be equipped to share the gospel with our neighbors we're going to include them in coming to we're going to invite them to come and hear the gospel we're going to be ready to share the gospel with them that's it very simple so today is just this our focus is on prayer we want to pray and here's what's going to happen. I, I'm very, very excited about this. And if you are up for joining in this journey, we have a tool that we're going to use. Again, it's a, a tool to mobilize our efforts and make them as effective as they can be. Here's what we're going to do. I, I, we're not just going to pray for our neighborhood and neighbors. Like, God, please you know, bring a revival and awakening. God, please bring lost neighbors to you. God, please bring you know, coworkers and uh, classmates and others to you, we're going to pray for them by name all across our community. We've got this great tool uh, that enables us to do it. Uh, we're going to pray in a focused and personal way. And I want to show you this video that's going to kind of set up what I want to ask you to, to employ as a tool. So let's go ahead and hit that. Raise up warriors, Lord, who will fight <laughs> on their knees. We can use the technology of today and use it as a harvest tool to reach souls for Christ. And now we have this incredible tool, BlessEveryHome.com. We're taking the latest consumer data and merging it with current mapping technology. To pray for every single person in our community by name. Sign up free at BlessEveryHome.com and you'll receive a map and list of your neighbors along with the tools to pray for them by name, care for, and share the gospel with them. The ease of use and convenience has literally taken away every excuse that we could possibly come up with for why we can't engage the Lord on our neighbor's behalf. There's also the ability to print out a list of names if you don't even have a computer. You can even highlight your pray, care, share journey with each neighbor home using the colored icon. 
Red means you are praying for that home. Yellow shows you know each other by name and you are caring for them. Choose green when you are actively sharing the gospel. Make the home blue when those neighbors are active disciples of Christ. Each neighbor home has its own journal. You can also choose to receive scheduled reminder emails with the next five neighbor homes to pray for that day. Your members will see their neighborhood in a whole new light. What are we waiting on? The harvest is now. Our prayer is that every single home in America is being prayed for by name. You'll never reach any more people than you pray for. If every believer would get behind Bless Every Home, we could see a revival in America beyond all we could hope think or imagine. Join Bless Every Home and see how prayer can change your community. Raise up a generation, Lord, that will take light into this world, that they will proclaim that there is salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. Raise them up, Lord, raise them up. Yeah, it's an incredible tool. We've staff and elders have already begun utilizing it. Uh, you don't have to wait till March to get in on the action. Uh, you will be able to pray for your neighbors by name, and there's other ways it will help prompt. So that the, the response to that today, if you're ready, is that you can use the QR code on the screen. We have these cards out in the lobby as well to take them. Also, Cameron and Mark and others of our staff will be out there if you need help navigating this to that website to sign up. We have a way to do it through the church which is how we'd like to ask you to do it, because what that will allow us to do in the month of March, I think, not that we're trying to, you know, make it about us at all, but I think as a source of encouragement and motivation for us, we're going to be able to track the neighbors that we collectively have prayed for. We'll be able to kind of build this accumulated uh, track record over the month of March of, of the neighbors and neighborhoods. We'll see it on a map who we've been able to pray for by name, if you're willing. I want to ask you to consider doing that, okay? So that's that. On the back of this card out in the lobby, too, we're going to get to what we're going to do, my third uh, action step for you, which is going to be about fasting. So we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. But second, I want to ask you to join with, if you're willing, join with this congregation to use a prayer guide because sometimes as we get into how prayer and fasting, well, what am I supposed to pray for for those neighbors? What am I supposed to pray for in general? How do I do that? Well, we're going we're gonna to engage in a way that's organized, educated, and coordinated. We're going to use this prayer guide to that end. So it's called Jesus Next Door. It's a 30-day prayer guide. The idea is we start on March 1st. By the way, we're going to have a, um, we're going to kind of celebrate this month-long effort with a Good Friday service on Friday night, March 29th, but then the, this would finish up on the 30th every day. I'm on about day 11 in this, kind of getting a head start already, and you're, it's okay to do that. You can go through it more than once if you want. Uh, between now and the end of March, but it is really good. It will take you through a process of praying for your own heart first, kind of getting our own selves right, like Second Chronicles 7.14 talked about, if my people will humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways, and then get us to where we need to be in a very targeted and, and educated way. So I want to encourage you, we've got copies of this, by the way, in the lobby. You can have one, I think it's one per household maybe, and if you need to order more, you can order more online or get more. Uh, I, I, we're going to ask everybody who's willing to go through this together. And perhaps in your small group, this would be a source of what you could focus on holding each other accountable and discussing uh, through the month of March as well. And then number three, hey, so this is our pilot mission briefing. Are right? you guys taking notes? We're gonna, these are our action items. I want you to do this. I want all of us to do this. And then number three, we're going to fast and pray. And there's a lot about fasting that may be brand new to you. You maybe have never fasted once in your life. Again, on the back of this card, there's what I think will be some helpful information about that, even if you've never encountered it ever before. Simple definitions of it, simple ways to do it. Understand, we understand. If, if somebody's like, got, you got a medical condition, you can't, we're not saying you know, that. You don't have to do that kind of a thing. But I, I'd love to call all of us to significant investments in fasting and praying. And to that end, there's a, another book for those of you that are interested in it that kind of goes with the blue one. And we don't have many copies of these. We've got a few out there. You can have one if you want. But if not, order one. You can see the title of it up there. But it's, it's a quick read. It's very well written. Uh, very in, uh, informational, educational, on specifically on the role of fasting and praying. And we do. We want to fast and pray 
for revival. And we're going to ask you to set up a, a meal or a day, multiple meals. We're going to track all of that. We'll roll that out here in February, end, uh, two weeks from now, um, what that schedule will look like in a similar way to how we'll be able to track all of the people we've prayed for by name. We'll be able to also track our efforts in dedicated times of fasting and prayer. Let me just read you a couple quotes I pulled from that orange book. And these are good realities for us to lay hold of. You'd be hard-pressed to find any significant movement of God across human history that was not first preceded by a group of faithful men and women who are committed to the Lord in prayer and fasting. So if this is the first time you've ever even considered it or heard about it, I know I'll give you a couple of days and weeks to think about it, but I want you to think about it because I want us to do it and be serious about doing it when March hits. Just to share a couple other quotes that I hope will be encouraging. Fasting is about spiritual feasting, not just bodily famine. That's one thing that has me excited about it. Fasting is not ultimately about what we let go of, but who we will let take hold of us. This is what I'm excited for us to experience together in March. The author says, I'm convinced that when the church begins to feast more fully with Jesus through prayer and fasting, the trickle from the temple will become the river that will redeem not only our neighborhoods, but also our nation. So, yeah, we showed you the cover of the book. And he's referring to a vision God gave Ezekiel for, obviously, a sweeping movement of, of the Spirit of God at some point. So we'll have the scheduling, as I mentioned, coming up on the 25th. And I want to look, project a little bit ahead to a couple things we've got going on that will be invitations for you, opportunities for you to invite those that you're sharing with. One, the reason I want to bring this up is because there's a need for a commitment to prayer already. With the organization, you know, that that I, I uh, work with called This Stuff Matters. We've got uh, an evangelistic event at Mars Hill and This Stuff Matters and FCA in conjunction with even uh, Mount Perrin Christian School. We're holding it at Mount Perrin Christian School. Saturday the 23rd of March, a, an evangelistic event with Mark Richt, Hall of Fame college football coach. All you Bulldog people, you know who he is. So uh, it was, a f anyway, former Georgia Bulldog coach. He's going to be sharing his story, his testimony, and we're going to be giving people a chance to pray to receive Christ that, that day. Uh, Mark Stevenson in our church is leading a prayer effort specifically to pray ahead for that event. So on the back of that card is a, is a place you can sign up if you're interested in joining that prayer initiative and movement. And then, of course, at the end of the month of March is when Easter hits. And you can already be looking ahead to that. And you'll know <clears throat> we're going to do three services that morning like we did on, on Christmas Eve. <clears throat> so that's coming up. That's what we have ahead of us. How did it get to be 1030 already? Is it, is it time? Here, here's, here's, here's what I want to do. I want to finish. We're not, we're not going to finish in, in song. I want to finish in prayer. Um, because for this to start, it has to start with me. There's a story in the late 1800s, a, a traveling evangelist that God used mighty, a guy named Gypsy Smith, and he traveled the world, it says, at least twice, preaching on every continent in many countries. And it seems that wherever he went, a great movement of the Spirit of God would really be manifest. And one day a group of people who had come from a certain community came to him and they said, we so desperately want to see revival in our area. Our area is so dry and dead. What can we do to see revival? And his answer was this, I'll tell you exactly how it will come about. He says, you go home, lock yourself in your bedroom, take a piece of chalk, put a circle on the floor of your bedroom, kneel in that circle. And pray fervently and brokenly that God will start a revival in that circle. I want to finish today in a similar vein. So I want to ask you, and I'll guide us here in just a second and close this in just a minute. I want to ask you just to get alone with God in your own circle here this morning. And if it's get out on your knees, I encourage you to do it. If you can't, obviously, don't. You can stay seated in your seat or get down on your knees at your seat or wherever you want to go. And let's take a minute just to say, oh God, let this start with me. And at a minimum, offer to God our willingness to move in the direction that I'm challenging us to move in together. So can we do that? Let me just give you a couple of minutes with the Lord here this morning to finish.
Let me just pray for us. God, I, I just ask that a real revival, a broken a brokenness of flesh and a filling of your spirit, Lord, that it would start right here on this rug. Oh God, let it start with me. God, let that be in every seat, in every home represented at Mars Hill, in every bedroom, every closet, every car where we drive, Lord, let us be that that's where it would start, that it would start with me. God, we want to be those people who know you, who walk with you, whose hearts break for the condition of the world and the condition of the lost souls, whose, whose hearts love with your love, Lord Jesus, that would cause you to leave heaven and die on a cross for us. God, fill us with that love, God. Fill us with your eyes, Lord, so we can see the need and we can see with compassion and that we can be moved and, and driven with your love. Because our world, it's, it's hurting and it's falling apart. God, we want not just some big movement. God, we want the small movement. We want our neighbors people we do know by name, people we will pray for by name, God. We want them. Even if there's no greater movement, there's just one soul. Every single soul is worth it, Lord Jesus, please. Let my neighbors, let my associations, let my acquaintances, God, let, use me to extend your love to them and to share the gospel with them. Use me to bring them into your family. And then, God, we do, we would long for, and we we're going to ask, we're going to ask for a movement of your spirit across Cobb County and Paulding County. And, God, I ask you to bless Brad Parkhurst and Vertical Life Church. God, I ask you to bless the other churches around us that, that bear your name and that, uh, that have the commission, Lord, and that stand on the gospel, Lord. Oh, God, light us all with your love and your light bring a revival. God, we, we do want hundreds. We do want thousands. We do want it to be where the society itself is transformed. Today, God, let it begin right here, right now. God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, as you go from this place, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you. May he lift his countenance upon you and be gracious to you. You're dismissed. Have a great day.